Welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Betty Chen. President Biden of the United States has delivered his third State of the Union address. In this address, Biden mentioned the situation in the Taiwan Strait for the first time. Let's take a look. And we're standing up against China's unfair economic practices. We're standing up for peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. I've revitalized our partnership and alliance in the Pacific, India, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Pacific Islands. I've made sure that the most advanced American technologies can't be used in China, not allowing to trade them there. Biden, who is running for re-election, specifically mentioned Taiwan and China in the State of the Union address, indicating that the relations between the U.S., China and Taiwan are a major focal point of his campaign. What else can be observed from Biden's remarks? Joining us today are Chen Bingkui, National Zhengzhou University Executive Master Program in Strategy and International Affairs CEO and Department of Diplomacy Associate Professor. Chen Fang Yu, Suzhou University Assistant Professor in Political Science, and Su Yan Bing, National Zhengzhou University Department of Political Science Professor. A warm welcome to all of you on the show. We heard President Biden address the situation in the Taiwan Strait, emphasizing the importance of maintaining peace and stability in the region. Why did Biden choose to make such a statement six months before the election? Who was this message specifically intended for? Was it directed at American voters, China or Taiwan? So let's start with today's conversation. So my first question is, how do you interpret Biden's message? I, th I think the state, state of the Union address is targeted at the domestic audience. So uh, it's basically the American voters who he wants to appeal for. Um, of course, the importance of the Taiwan issue in American foreign policy is very salient. However, I do think that uh, Biden mentioned this because he wants to sell his, uh, he wants to sell his Asian policy, he wants to sell his alliance policy, he wants to tell the American people his foreign policy achievement. Mm -hmm. What's your take on this, Fang Yu? Well, I think uh, he uses uh, the words that uh, has been starting to use uh, when he took office. So he's internationalized the, the uh, importance of the cross trade issues. So to put this uh, stability of the Taiwan Strait into a lot of different kind of agreements with other countries. So I think alliance is one of the most important things that he wants to emphasize. Mm -hmm. So, um, Yan Bing, do you think that in this State of the Union address, because the election is around the corner, do you think that Biden is trying to uh, differentiate, uh, differentiate himself from Trump? Uh, yes. Um, I think the uh, State of um, Union uh, address um, provides a lot of um, information for both uh, domestic audience and the international audience. Um, but uh, most importantly, I think uh, what he mentioned about the issues of uh, Taiwan Strait is to um, make sure to everyone that uh, the um, Biden administration will keep uh, the current promise and the current um, policy. And um, the other thing is that um, um, Biden tries to uh, differentiate himself uh, from uh, Trump that he is uh, the more reliable and stable leader uh, than Trump. And um, so uh, the, to, to make sure that the current uh, Indo-Pacific policy uh, will uh, still keep um, is very important for Biden's uh, um, campaign um, uh, winning, I think. So Yan Bing just mentioned that in the State of the Union address, yeah. Biden tries to convey the image of himself being the stable leader. Do you think that people would really buy this? Or like what kind of image does Biden try to convey in this speech, Fang Yu? Well, I think uh, the China policy or the so-called U.S.-China-Taiwan relations is not only about China itself, because uh, in the competition or, uh, with China, the American administration has a, a, a whole of government approach. That is, the China policy is associated with trade, with the t development of technology, with the foreign policies, with uh, uh, alliances. 
so with a lot of different dimensions. So I think um, it's very important that the U.S. Ju ju just want to ensure, make sure that the domestic uh, audience knows this, and also the international alliances also know this, because it not only takes one country or the mm -hmm. bilateral relations to, uh, to compete with China. So Biden just uh, emphasized that, okay, there's the, uh, the infrastructure, uh, the, the trade uh, and the tech uh, war, and also the alliance uh, with uh, other countries. So it's a, it's a, a, a multiple dimensions there. I think you have just mentioned, um, Bing Kui, that the State of the Union address is mainly focusing on the domestic people. So what significance will the U.S.-China-Taiwan relations mean for the American voters? So, uh, well, there is a trend in the American public that people are getting uh, more knowledgeable and recognize that, that Taiwan is an important issue for the U.S. foreign policy. So according to a survey la that is done last year, 47% uh, of uh, U.S. voters believes that uh, Taiwan is a very important uh, issue in U.S.-China foreign policy, U.S.-China relations. Another recent survey shows that all, about half of American people agree or support uh, American uh, government to defend Taiwan militarily. Mm -hmm. So that shows that there are more and more uh, ordinary people in the U.S. recognize that Taiwan is important for the U United States, which is a good news for mm -hmm. Taiwan, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, Yan Bing, do you agree that people in the U.S. are really paying closer attention to, say, the situation in the Taiwan Strait or the dynamics among the U.S., China, and Taiwan? Well, in my opinion, I, th uh, I have another uh, kind of a thought. Uh, I think, of course, the statement by, made by uh, Biden matters a lot for Taiwanese people, uh, but I'm not sure whether it matters that much for the American voters. Uh, um, one important thing is that um, even though we noticed that uh, in 2022, uh, Biden signed and enacted the so-called um, National Defense Authorization Act uh, for the fiscal year of 2023, 20, uh, uh, which includes a 10 billion uh, military uh, aid for Taiwan over the next five years. But if we compare other situations, for example, what is going on in Ukraine and in Israel, uh, in, only in 2023, uh, the U.S. provided uh, 3.8 billion uh, U, um, military aid to Israel. And from 2022 to 2023, uh, to 20, uh, 23, uh, the U.S. provided Ukraine with uh, more than 46 billion uh, military aid. So compared to these two um, cases, um, I think the uh, American voters might uh, pay more attention to uh, issues in Ukraine or, and uh, mm -hmm. in Israel. But that doesn't mean that the American voters don't care about Taiwan. But uh, what I just said is that you know uh, it's kind of um, a comparison issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's your take on this, Fang Yu? Well, I, I want to add a, another dimension here because in the bill drafted by the Congress and it is already passed by the Senate, that is, they are discussing about uh, uh, the, how to prioritize the military aid. Yeah. So the first one is Ukraine, and the second one is Israel, and the third one is Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So I, I do believe that the Taiwan issue is now on the top priority of the United States uh, foreign policies. So I, uh, although, well, <laughs> the political science uh, theories tell us that uh, ordinary people do not really care about the foreign <laughs> policies. However, I do think that it is uh, in, I think it's uh, on, on the agenda of mm -hmm. the U.S. foreign policies. And also, there's a bipartisan support for, for Taiwan. Indeed, bipartisan support that is critically important, right? right. Recent events such as the capsizing of a Chinese fishing boat in the waters off Taiwan's Jinmen Islands and the subsequent breakdown in talks have escalated tensions in the region. Furthermore, the incident involving the Chinese Coast Guard using water cannons against a Philippine resupply ship in the South China Sea has compounded these tensions. So does Biden's statement serve as a caution to Beijing and uh, telling them that you should not take any hasty actions? Do you think that they are really achieving that? Maybe we start with Yang Bing. Yes. Uh, first of all, the, the, uh, the incidence of this uh, capsizing of the uh, China's boats is um, pretty unfortunate. And also the subsequent, uh, the subsequent uh, breakdown in talks is also uh, unfortunate, but it's not very surprising. Um, but I'm not sure we can consider 
uh, Biden's statement as a caution uh, to Beijing against uh, its hasty actions. Um, well, if we really want to consider Biden's uh, statement as a kind of clue for caution to uh, China's action, uh, we can see what happened in uh, the, uh, at the end of February. So uh, on February 29th, uh, the Chinese uh, Defense mili uh, Ministry uh, denied the existence of a midline uh, of the Taiwan Strait. Well, it's not the first time that China's uh, government uh, did that, uh, but uh, I think that um, probably China, um, Biden's statement uh, can uh, serve as a kind of uh, caution against uh, China's hostile statement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bing Kui, what's your take on this? Do you think this is a strong signal to Beijing? I don't think the address itself, the speech itself, is a signal mm -hmm. to a specific event in Asia. And if you, if you take a look at the State of the Union address, you will find that the part on Asia or on China is really, really short compared to, let's say, Russia or Ukraine or Europe. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think Biden is trying to address China on particular actions or mm -hmm. events. And uh, however, if the U.S. try to focus on any events in Asia, I would say the Philippine case will be something that U.S. care more about because um, Chinese actions in uh, in South China Sea and nearby uh, the Second Thomas Shoal is getting increased. Mm -hmm. um, so the threat to the Philippines and therefore the danger of uh, of conflict in uh, in the vicinity area is increased mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. What's your take on this, Fang Yu? Well, I agree with Bing Kui and Yan Bing because mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's no need for a uh, president to address the, the so to uh, to specific events, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 the U.S. and the, F the Philippines are treaty alliances, so mm -hmm. so they have to uh, respond to Chinese uh, assertions mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in this area. So uh, let's let's wait and see because mm -hmm. they have to respond, and China is uh, indeed more uh, ambitious on this uh, region. Right. In early March, U.S. senators from both parties proposed a bill stipulating that should the president conclude that China has initiated military action against Taiwan, the Treasury Department is required to end the U.S.-China tax treaty within 30 days. The bill aims to withhold tax advantages from nations that resort to military aggression against neighboring countries with the goal of deterring aggressive behavior in the Indo-Pacific region. So do you think that this legislation can act as an, as an effective deterrent to Beijing, Fang Yu? Well, I think uh, the more the better. <laughs> so <laughs> well, there's nothing that can effectively uh, deter Beijing. So the more the better. And I think uh, the importance of this act is uh, a symbolic move that the U.S. trying to lead the actions or discuss, discussion about this, uh, especially to the alliances. Because there's, uh, if there's only one country to have this uh, kind of uh, a sanction, it's, it's no, no, no use. So mm -hmm. uh, they have to encourage more alliance to join a mm -hmm. similar move to uh, increase the cost of using force on, on Beijing. And Bing, do you agree this is a, just a symbolic gesture? Well, uh, formally, um, we have to notice that the uh, legislation is actually just at the beginning uh, stage. So basically, there uh, is still a long way to go. So as we can see for other kind of Taiwan-friendly um, policies made by uh, the U.S. Congress, uh, usually it takes like maybe one year or two years uh, for going through the whole process for uh, the legislation making. But uh, after all, I, I mean, um, I, it's still very pretty good uh, to see that there is a kind of uh, bipartisan consensus mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S. Congress to take various different kind of policy measures to deter China's aggressive behavior in the Indo-Pacific region. So let me put it this way. If we're talking about these maybe the symbolic gestures, mm -hmm. what will be substantively the real effective deterrence um, to China? Well, <laughs> but, um, first, first of all, I have to add that uh, tax treaty is very common between countries mm -hmm. who establish diplomatic re relations. In the case of China and the U.S., this treaty is, is established to encourage investors and mm -hmm. protect investors. So the U.S. and China can renounce the treaty uh, by giving a notice, and six months later, the treaty will be terminated. The mm -hmm. only difference here is that um, 
the, what's, what happens in the third party in Taiwan Strait mm -hmm. can provoke an action from the U.S. government. So mm -hmm. that's, why, that's why this legislation may be a little bit special. Mm -hmm. However, I, I also would agree that it is symbolic. So uh, in order to deter, um, we, from a theoretical point of view, we do know that we need arms, we, right. need, we need defense, mm -hmm. we, need, we need to show resolves. Mm -hmm. That's very important. We have to communicate the resolve to uh, the, the rivals mm -hmm. so uh, the rivals will understand that uh, we are capable and we are resolved to mm -hmm. defend ourselves. Fang Yu. Well, uh, yeah. I agree with everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so right now, uh, it's not only about a discussion on this uh, tax uh, uh, treaty here. So whether it's tax or economic mm -hmm. sanctions, yeah. maybe they're just not so There's effective. A, yeah, <laughs> the, the whole Indo-Pacific strategy is designed to deter China of using force. I mean, one of mm -hmm. the main uh, goals is there. Right. So there's, it takes a, a lot of uh, different kinds of mm -hmm. policies, the military one, the diplomacy one, and the economic one. So, so it's not only about this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else you would like to add? Yeah, um, well, I, I, I uh, agree with um, Professor Binkui's um, point that, uh, well, we, we cannot just you know, rely on um, the U.S. goodwill for, right. uh, uh, you know, um, defend ourselves against um, China's possible ag aggressive uh, action. Uh, we also need to rely on our, our own capability and also right. develop our own our morale, uh, which mm -hmm. is very important. And also, the, I think the U.S. government is also looking at what uh, the uh, Taiwanese people and Taiwanese government is doing right. uh, for, um, you know, um, sort of uh, strengthening our capability. Yes. And there is also, you know, different issues going on, such as the leaking of uh, intelligence, etc. you know. Um, so um, there are various issues that we have to deal with. With. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. In his State of the Union address, Biden repeatedly brought up China, challenging the narrative that China is on the rise and America is falling behind. They've got it backwards. He asserted that America is advancing and reaffirmed his strong stance against China's unfair economic tactics. He also highlighted that the trade imbalance between the U.S. and China has reached its lowest point in more than 10 years and often mentioned former President Trump. Let's delve into this segment of his speech. Frankly, for all this tough talk on China, it never occurred to my predecessor to do any of that. I want competition with China, not conflict. And we're in a stronger position to win the conflict of the 21st century against China than anyone else for that matter, than any time as well. Biden highlighted that the relationship between the U.S. and China centers on competition rather than conflict, noting the fine distinction between the two. So how do you interpret the overall tone of Biden's speech? Do you think that he's adopting a more aggressive approach a, or a more conciliatory approach towards Beijing? Who would like to start? Well, I think the overall tone of Biden's uh, speech uh, is pretty much consistent with what the uh, administration has done. So, uh, so in short, it, there is nothing um, surprising or, or or nothing new. Uh, but uh, but the signal here is that he really wants to make sure that everyone knows that uh, he's going to keep his promise and uh, also the policy priorities um, should he be re-elected. Uh, re yeah. Okay. I think the key phrase in that episode is predecessors. Mm -hmm. So Biden is trying to compare with Trump, mm -hmm. and uh, he actually tried to compare with Trump in the most part of the speech. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's trying to show that his government is uh, better than mm -hmm. Trump's government and will be better if, they, uh, got, uh, if he got reelected. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important point. So, so that, that tells you the speech itself is trying to communicate with uh, the American voters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is trying to say that what Trump has done didn't work. Mm -hmm. And what I have done here so, so far for the last four years has worked. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, think, I think it's not a reconciliatory tone, but a reassuring tone. Mm -hmm. It is trying to reassure American people, American voters, analysts, scholars, and also foreign leaders Mm -hmm. who has doubts or concerns about American foreign policy. Try to make sure that Americans will 
will continue to lead, will continue to um, unite uh, different countries mm -hmm. in the world. So, Fang Yi, do you think that Biden has successfully convinced, say, leaders or the American voters that he is a better or a, a more stable leader? It's very it's always very difficult to convince <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the voters or the audience. Right. But I do think that he has successfully uh, expressed the right. difference mm -hmm. between him and Trump. So mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Trump does not care the leadership of the whole world. And also he can put everything into uh, negotiation. And also he does not really care about making the alliance. Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, I mean, there's a indeed significant distinct between him and uh, Mr. Trump. And also, I, I like the part that he uh, expressed the age uh, problem. Mm -hmm. He says that it's not <laughs> about age, it's, it's about idea. So the right. idea, I mean, he says that he uh, hints that mm -hmm. Trump's idea is very old. <laughs> yeah, so so I, I do like that, that part. Yeah. Right. So moving on, um, upon assuming office, Biden has maintained the tariffs which was introduced by Trump. But then he also have uh, other restrictions regarding the uh, exports for U.S. high-tech goods. So do you think that if he gets re-elected, he will continue on this path? I, I think Biden administration does not focus on uni unilateral sanctions against mm -hmm. China. Uh, I think the administration recognizes that um, the tax war or trade war between U.S. and China does not compel China to... Uh, change its policy. Mm -hmm. As you can see, during the, during the speech, Biden again uh, addressed the issues, economic issues between U.S. and China, and he says that uh, he will use a lot of different measures. Now, now uh, tariff is not a very effective measure, mm -hmm. so, I, so I do not think that he will, he will, he will uh, escalate um, tariff, tariff barriers. I think, however, he will try to use other means such as international institutions mm -hmm. and, and common measures with uh, U.S. allies. Mm -hmm. uh, I think th at least the, the administration believes that those are the better measures to mm -hmm. coerce China. All right. But going back to economic measures, do you think that in the future will the U.S. increase the uh, tariffs on electric vehicles as a strategic move to uh, kind of control China? Well, uh, compared to Trump, uh, I think Biden uh, is trying to uh, take more various issues to uh, take um, to take actions to defend uh, the national interests of the United States against China. So, for example, uh, in just past few days, uh, Biden uh, said that uh, he will definitely sign and enact the uh, legislation uh, about uh, TikTok, right? And, and um, so, and. Uh, during the campaign uh, of the you know Republican primaries, uh, Trump uh, has already mentioned um, well many times that uh, he's uh, trying to um, you know uh, enact uh, more tariffs against uh, China should he be uh, elected. So uh, that means that Trump is trying to uh, build up his own brand by uh, making. Um, a kind of image that he is the one who is going to use tariff to, as mm -hmm. a weapon to uh, defend uh, the U.S. Uh, national interest. And in that point, I don't think that Biden tr uh, wants to uh, compete with mm -hmm. uh, Trump by using the same uh, rhetoric. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we know these are two, um, you can say, they do share some similarities and there are some differences. If you look at the trade war, which was initiated by Trump, actually Biden continued on the same path. Uh, do you think that what's, what would be the, how can we differentiate between their strategies in this regard? And who would be, uh, say, preferred by Beijing if elected? Fang Yu. Well, it's very difficult to uh, think what, is Beijing is thinking so? So I, I I do think that there's pros and cons for uh, mm -hmm. different uh, leaders right. there. So Biden is making more alliance and uh, on the international institutions. So uh, it's a it's a um, multilateral way to uh, deter Beijing. However, Mr. Trump has t a more direct ways in a bilateral sense mm -hmm. that uh, he, there's more, I mean, there will be more extreme policies <laughs> by um, Mr. Trump. So, mm -hmm. so for Beijing, I think 
I don't, I don't know who, mm -hmm. who they prefer. What's your take on this, Bing Kui? Uh, nobody asked Beijing yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, we don't uh, know. We don't know, but most observers agree that Beijing would prefer a predictable leader. Mm -hmm. So Trump, um, it, Beijing doesn't know how to deal with Trump because they, don't, they do not know what kind of move Trump would take if he got reelected. However, in, turn, in, in case of a Biden administration, I think the Beijing would be uh, better off by uh, knowing how to deal with uh, bi bilateral conflicts, mm -hmm. and and they are they are they can better manage their differences mm -hmm. as well. What's your view on this? Yeah, I think uh, well, uh, I guess uh, Beijing might consider uh, Trump as a person who is more willing to negotiate, like uh, Fang Yu just said. Uh, but uh, the only thing that is for sure is that uh, Trump is actually more unpredictable than uh, Biden. So uh, in that sense, uh, I think China would consider Biden as a kind of uh, hardliners and predictable uh, hardliners, uh, which is good you know, or bad, um, uh, depending on um, what kind of perspectives. Um, but the thing is that uh, because um, Biden's administration is more predictable, uh, it will um, provide more uh, space or opportunity for China to prepare. But unlike uh, um, Trump, uh, it is uh, more unpredictable. Uh, so everything can change, but it also can provide some leeway for China mm -hmm. to uh, do something to negotiate with uh, Trump if he uh, is re um, elected. Mm -hmm. yeah. So talking about uh, the um, unpredictability of mm -hmm. Trump, who knows he may be changed for the better or for the worse, we don't yeah. know yet. But that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much. If you like our show, please search for us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.